Hi, my name is Jonna and I play football for Chelsea FC and for the Swedish national team. And you are listening to the Blue Day podcast. Fellow Chelsea supporters, welcome back, my friends, to the podcast that will never end. Yes, this is the Blue Day podcast, and for Chelsea fans everywhere, every day is a Blue Day. And boy, howdy, we are going to laugh at Arsenal and their fans today. I am your host, a man with a face and a new haircut for podcasting, Keith Lawrence. And joining me again this week is another happy Chelsea supporter who made 164 Chelsea appearances, don't you know? It's Steve Wick. Steve? Here at this podcast, we don't want to brag and boast over a a derby win, but to hell with it. Let's do it for this week. Let's let's, let's start it off. Arsenal nil, Chelsea 2, beating them at their own backyard. Pretty much dominated the game. We looked miles better than them. When should we laugh at them now, or should we do it in five minutes' time? Well, I I (laughs) think. Listen, um, if it wasn't for the goalkeeper, Leno, it could have been five or six. He yeah. had a very good game. He had a very good game. and uh, But I've always found in football not to laugh because I'd say oh, it has a habit of putting it back on you. And um, yeah, it was a brilliant performance. Very professional. I hope you saw what I was talking about with Lukaku, about having a focal point up there. Oh. Where you can lay the ball off and get it back. And Havertz looked different class in, in that role he played. Uh, and Lukaku, I just want to ask people the question. Is Lukaku, let's get this right, I've got to do my math, £67 million pounds worse a player than Harry Kane? Absolutely not. Well, that's the difference in price of what we paid for him and what Tottenham want for Kane. And I actually think Lukaku, I said to you before, he's not immobile at all. He's quite mobile, but because he's so big, he doesn't look as if he's mobile. Hmm. And I thought he terrified the two centre-backs at Arsenal on Saturday. And it just goes to show that, um, you know, how different Chelsea can be. It's it's given them another string to their bow. Um, And it's exciting. It was lovely and refreshing to see Chelsea have a focal point up top. And I'm not knocking Timo Werner at all, but he's not a Lukaku. He's not somebody that's going to hold the ball up. He's not somebody that's going to be an overall presence against the back line. He's not going to be a bully whereby he's going to terrorise, as you say, the centre-half. Lukaku, for his goal, just shoved Mari off. Mari wanted to swap shirts. Lukaku just nudged him out the way and Mari's spinning Lukaku has a tap in it was it was just very very refreshing to see and we haven't had a presence like that for so long probably since the last time we won the league with Costa and Drogba before that so so far Lukaku no actually pun intended he's got the look like Roxette's son He's he has he has got the look. My goodness, he was outstanding. But yeah. the one thing that I saw from the game, and this is from years of watching football, but more specifically watching players, was how refreshed or how beefed up, so to speak, were the players around him. Havertz looked a different player. Kovacic looked a different player. Mount was the looked more sort of sharper. He looked more sort of like, right, Lukaku's making a run or he's holding him off. I've got space to run. It's as you say, it gives them more of a more of a dimension. But my goodness, 
somebody that we desperately needed. Last season, we needed a centre forward like that. I'd say the season before, we needed a centre forward like that. And now that we've got him, I'm not saying we're going to score five or six goals every single game, but it's going to be close. Well, I, I think that um, every Chelsea player that was on the field benefited from Lukaku being up top. And um, every single player. Um, and you know, as well as I do, that the most important thing is belief. And now Chelsea are playing with an extra dimension to their game. The belief in that squad should be we've got a real chance here of being a little bit special this season. Um, and I think it shows, you know, you won't go to Arsenal that often. I know that, and well, we haven't. And as I said, if it wasn't for the goalkeeper, it could have been four, five, six. Um, and that was a great performance, but it just showed you. I think we had a little chat about it in our previous podcast about how important that focal point is, that leader of the line is. And he, by example, led the way on on on, on Saturday and was and bullied the two uh, Arsenal centre backs. He was a, he bullied them. Um, and Chelsea grew on that and they got so confident. He was a listen, you're never going to win um, a London derby quite as easy as that. You, you're never going to win a derby playing nice. No. You have to be rough. You have to, you know, take the game to your opponents. And Lukaku did it. And I, even there were some great individual performances, you know, like Rudiger, for example. He outshone a, a lot of players on, on Saturday, but, oh, sorry, on Sunday. I wouldn't say that it was the perfect performance because I do, my personal opinion, Arsenal looked very poor and Chelsea, same, quite similar with Palace. They didn't need to be completely at their best. Yes, they needed to be solid. They needed to stay in control of the game, game management, very, very important. And Chelsea did that well. And I think they've got a manager that implements that minute by minute. You know, he is very precise and detailed. Chelsea haven't got to fifth gear yet and albeit it is only two games great time to play Arsenal the way they're pretty much f- falling completely as a top club but two wins out of two in the league you can't go wrong no goals conceded we've got Liverpool coming up on Saturday very very tough game but I again I expect L- Lukaku against Van Dijk it'll be interesting who wins out of that duel. Havertz, we'll talk we'll talk about him briefly now, but you said it at the start of the season, Havertz, you feel he's going to have a kick on and have a fantastic season. He's probably going to be the most beneficial player with Lukaku here now. Mm. I, I, listen, I, I, listen, I think him and Mason, I, I think, could, you know, there's nothing better than looking to play a ball into the box and get the return in the box. And we haven't had that. That has been totally devoid of our, our the way we've played because we haven't had a number nine. Hmm. And, um, you know, I, Werner is uh, not a Lukaku number nine. He's not a, uh, he's not a Harry Kane number nine. He floats and glides everywhere, but you've got to be strong and physical. And I'm sure, have you heard the thing that Klopp said at the weekend about our physical Burnley were? Yes, I have. Um, I did read the comments that Klopp was not happy with Burnley's approach. I did read the comments about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer not happy with Southampton's approach and about how they're moaning already that referees are you know, not clamping down on these challenges. At the end of the day, not every challenge is a foul. No, but he's doing that because he's playing Chelsea on Saturday. He's doing that to alert the referees to Lukaku. Because he's, he, he's a little bit, you know, he's not... I think that's a great thing is the fact that he's already thinking about playing Chelsea and, and straight after the game, 
he wants to put that micro microscope on Lukaku because of his physicality. And I think that's a really that says everything to me in terms of how frightened not frightened that's not the right word because I don't think Liverpool ever be frightened but how apprehensive they are about playing Chelsea on Saturday Reading between the lines with that then do you feel that Klopp has done that mind games wise because he feels Virgil van Dijk is not 100% do you think that he's obviously looking at that because he feels Whoever he puts with Van Dyke, Lukaku's going to look at that and go, right, that's the weak point, so I'm going to stay with him. Yeah. It'll be very, very interesting. And as you, you know, you, you did make a good point about Klopp. He's you know, started off moaning and groaning as usual. And I think he stayed at Liverpool too long because you know the, the city and the people, they always moan and bloody groan. But yeah. I want to talk about the team, like Chelsea's team we did sort of do like a little preview last week it didn't surprise me Alonso started I thought Alonso and he's another one who I think will benefit with Lukaku being the focal point because if Lukaku holds the ball up Alonso's just going to go thank you very much run down the wing receives the ball he's got a good cross on him not all the time it's worked but most of the time he's going to have a it could be he's going to have a very similar season to what he had when he first arrived. When we had Costa and Hazard up top, Alonso came up with a few goals, but he also came up with some great runs going forward. Yeah. This could be a good season for him. And yeah, as, as as you say, Steve, Liverpool will be a tough test. I don't... F- I don't think we'll win, my personal opinion. I don't think we'll win at Anfield. I think it'll be a draw. But even so, it'll be a great test for our team. And also to see how we get on against a side who I think will be up there challenging for the title this season. Yeah, I agree. I, I think I think I'm looking at I think it's out of four, to be honest with you. I think it's out of um Liverpool, Man City, Man United and Chelsea. I think that's the fourth. Um, and I just look at it uh, and I, I said to all, to you, what we achieved last year with to become champions of Europe with a, a leading goal scorer of eight um, and to not have that extra dimension that we've got now, I think it, it, it says a lot for the, the belief in the club. And now, if everyone believes that what the business that has been done has, has given us another dimension to our play, then that will, I think, will go a long, long way in confidence of the club, of the team, and they will just go from strength to strength. And also, the Kane saga with Man City, everyone knows Man City need a centre-forward. Need that, that, that man that's going to be the focal... Again, they're lacking the focal point that we've lacked. And I think, as it stands now, I think we're favourites to win the league. It can change, and we've only had two games, and West Ham are uh, top of the league. So, but I honestly believe that we could be favourites to win the league. And I'm not the only one. There's been a lot of pundits on the radio that say that Chelsea are favourites. Yeah. But it, it, this whole thing is, we're now playing an extra dimension we're playing a different way and Tuchel is bright enough to, to use to maximise that um, and I think it, it bodes well for the future and you look at the difference with squad depth as well you look at who didn't play against Arsenal but perhaps you would think he's got the talent but for one reason or another they're not sort of playing on a regular basis. To players like Ben Chilwell, Callum hudson Adoy, Great to see Hakim Ziyech come off the bench for the last five sort of ten minutes because he actually sharpened his game and he looked more in, in control and he had sort of a spring in his step. People like Kurt Zuma, who looked as if he could be on his way out this week. But the, the, the squad depth is... Quite staggering. It does remind me a little bit of 
Chelsea under Mourinho, the first two time between 2004, 2006 with the squad depth. Reminds me of that a little bit in terms of quality. And yeah, people are calling us favourites. I'm still a little bit sceptical. I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. I think there's three teams for the title this season in us, Liverpool and City. I don't think United are there. I think they've got some of the ingredients, but they haven't got the chef for it. That's my opinion. Um, so, okay, I'm going to call you Gordon from now on. Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> Gordon. No, I might, right. I might drink more than him, but I do not swear as much as him. I, I can assure you. But it'll be. It is going to be a fascinating season. But I just wanted to sort of touch on a little bit talk in terms of midfield. I thought Kovacic on Jorginho. They look so different. I'm not talking about Jorginho's hairstyle. They play so differently now to what they did two years ago, three years ago. They just have such an understanding with each other. And I'm not just saying that because we've played two mid-table teams, but how they play. They're not going to get us goals, but my God, they're going to help out that midfield. And it helps the the wing-backs go forward. It gives them an option to go forward because they know they've got the protection of Jorginho and the stamina of Kovacic in that midfield. And this is where you get the free space with Havertz and Mount just to not do what they want, but they can be more creative. And Kante coming into the squad as well. My goodness, I mean that... You've got everything, haven't you? You, You've got everything. You've got, you know, if you have Jorginho, Kante and you know, you've got every type of player in that three. You've got your holding player, you've got your passing player, and you've got the one that drives forward. You know, Kovacic drives forward and he, he goes forward with the ball and he's quite direct. So you've got a complete blend of every sort of type of midfield player you can have. And then you go up front and I always, I always, you know, when I think of football, I, if I was a cut, you almost draw a line in the final third and you say to Mount, and you say to the front players, when you're in that final third, you do what you want to do. You've got license to thrill. You've got license to do what you want to do. But up until that final third, we are organised, regimented, and we know exactly what we're doing. And that's the way I think Tuchel plays. Um, and Havertz, Mount, Lukaku, and the wide players that we've got, God, that is one ingredient, Gordon, to <laughs> to create havoc. And I think that that you know, and our, as you as you said earlier, our squad, I think, is better than Man City. I think it's certainly better than Liverpool. You know, I I think that's where Liverpool could fail. I don't think they've got strength in depth. They're starting to rely on the youngsters and the young players. And I don't think they've got the strength in depth. I think Man City's squad is very, very good. But I actually think ours is better. Plus, I think when you look at comparing the front three of ours to front three of Liverpool, yes, Liverpool's front three is impressive. With all due respect, and I'm not being ageist, they are getting on a little bit. You know, Mo Salah's approaching the 30 mark. Mane, I believe he's 29, 30. Firmino's early 30s. So they're going to have to change it round a little bit. They haven't got anybody there that can take one of their places. Whereas us, we spend £98 million on a beast who has scored over 100 Premier League goals, which is forgotten about, by the way, by certain Chelsea supporters. And I just want to reiterate the fact that this guy, yes, he played for Man United and I can you know, live with that. But he scored a hun- over 100 Premier League goals for different clubs. He knows this league. Mm. He's got a point also, to prove because he hasn't won this league yet. Yeah. And also, Keith, a lot of those goals he scored were in not convincing sides like Everton and West Brom. You know, they weren't the best sides in the, in, in the country. Absolutely. Right? You know, and um, I said to you, there were three players that Chelsea could have signed. Harry Kane, Haaland, and Lukaku. And actually, as I said to you, 
there's no way Lukaku is 67 million pound worse a player than Kane. So I think Chelsea have done their business well. And when you consider all the, the youngsters they've sold, I think he's cost us about six million quid, hasn't he? Looking at that, yes. As you've mentioned, the Chelsea transfers, as we're talking now, and this episode will go out later in the week, so there will probably be more outgoings. But Davide Zabacosta has gone to Atalanta for 10 million quid. Very decent right back for the Italian Serie A. Didn't work out for him in the Premier League. My favourite memory of him will always be his goal in the Champions League against the Carrier Bags in the group stage. Fabulous finish. If you ever get the chance, find it on YouTube or be on BT Sports or whatever on the highlights. It was a fabulous finish. I was there. He stand up. Uh, I know we won the game five or six nil, but that goal, I know it was a cross, looked as if it, but fabulous finish. But he looks like he's he, he's gone to, back to Serie A. Timmy Bakayoko, who hasn't done great for Chelsea, he spent one year with us. Um, he was been on loan for loads of clubs since 2018. 35 million we spent on him. Not the greatest purchase, but he looks like he's going to go to Milan again on loan with uh, hopefully an obligation to buy because we need to get people like that out of the club quick so we can free up the wage bill and free up more transfers for possible incomings next year. So there does seem to be a lot of movement with Chelsea the next sort of week or so. The transfer window does end next week. Um, we will hopefully maybe even do a bit of a transfer special, possibly on our Facebook page, potentially. So watch out for that one. But Steve, just quickly to touch on it, do you expect any more incomings at Chelsea or do you think that that's it now? Well, they're talking about the French centre-back, aren't they? Is it, I'm trying to think Kunde, of yeah. Yeah, Jules, Jules right. Kunde, yeah. You know, the, the, you know, the thinking of him, there's speculation that uh, our boy's going to West Ham. Kurt Zuma, yeah. Um, so if, if we get him in and Zuma goes to West Ham, then, again, they're paying for each other. And this is what I say. The one thing about Chelsea, is their, their recruitment and how they do business is absolutely unbelievable in terms of our players, by the time... That academy is a massive side of the business side of Chelsea. They pay effectively for the boys they buy in the first thing. And, and Bakioko, every time he goes out on loan, there'll be a loan fee. Well, this is it. Ev, that's right, yep. That loan fee will be pay, paying the loss of someone that we've bought that hasn't made it, that hasn't done it. But the loan fees that we will charge on that will take a great chunk of it out of that thing. And who's the boy at Southampton that we sold? Is that the right back? We discussed him the other week. He was the right back who won Player of the Year. I'm trying to think. Valentino of his name. Livramento. Mate, he was the best player on the field against Man United. He was unbelievable against Manchester United. But there will be a buyback clause in that. All right, it might be 25 million. I think they sold him for five, didn't they? We sold him for five million, yeah. Yeah, but there'd be a buy, maybe 25. Thousand, uh, sorry, twenty five million pounds to buy him back, but at least we have that option. And if he improves the way he could improve, and the way certainly the way he played on Saturday, then it'd be worth every penny of that. Well, it depends. I mean, again, Aspliqueta is not getting any younger. He's been a fabulous servant for the club, and actually, today as we as we are recording, it's the anniversary. On this day in twenty twelve, we signed him. And yeah, what, what a, a what a servant he has been for Chelsea Football Club. Seven million pounds we signed him for. He's been unbelievable, and he's been a leader of men as well. I quite, I, I like the way he is. I like the way he, he projects himself. Uh, a real dedicated professional footballer that leads by example. Absolutely, absolutely fantastic signing for the club. And I. I will go on record to say it because I've asked Laqueta, who's one of my favourite players. He should be talked about in regards to overall all time Chelsea 11, especially on that right hand side. When you yeah. think about who we've had there in the past, think of what he's accomplished, how many good Chelsea sides he's 
he's been in fabulous servant wonderful professional my goodness he's still got he's, he's still got years to go in in in, in all effectiveness he's got he looks after, after himself yes he, he he will be you know he could play for another two three years um but no absolutely all those young men looking up at the first team surely must look at him and think one example one example professional footballer definitely just want to uh, briefly touch on Rhys James's performance I know he didn't play against Palace he, he, he didn't start but he started against Arsenal looked very very good he scored a fabulous goal his run was sensational and even the movement of Lukaku and Havertz drawn in, Tierney in, gave all the space to James, especially for the goal, but mostly in that first half. Great finish. The individual, and I'm not going to call him a fan, I ain't going to call him a hooligan, but the individual who threw the bottle at Reese James, shame on you. And, you know, people talk, and this is one thing that sort of bugs me a little bit in regards to... Uh, you know, I don't want to make it this political, all this taking of the knee, whatever opinions you have on it and respecting whatever race you come from, the abuse Reese James got in that end at Arsenal, you know, p- people shouldn't throw stones at glass houses. That's, 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 all, that's all I'm saying. At the end of the day, you could tell from the slow motion pictures what fans are pretty much saying to him. And these are the same fans that were complaining that other fans were booing. My God, I forgot his name. The left winger who missed the penalty for England. Saka. Saka, okay, yeah. 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 These are the same fans that are moaning because one of their own is being booed because of missing a penalty. Well, then these are the same fans that are pretty much abusing Reese James right in front of his face just because he scored a goal. Whether you, whether that's right or wrong, whether you know, two wrongs don't make a right, Steve. And I just think that there there is banter, but then there's also going too there is there is also going too far. And people that, that want to throw bottles at people because you've got the ump, you know, you don't deserve to to go to a football match. You you know, you should no, be in no, a zoo. No. It's not agree, Keith. I agree, but but you know something this. Just kneeling before a game, and I know I understand where it's coming from, and I understand, and, and there shouldn't be racial prejudice. It's one of the worst things in football. But you know something? The only way we're going to change this is by educating our children at school and educating them. We can't change history. We can't do that. That's done. But we can change the future. And I'd like to see a little sign that says, all lives matter. And I think if we did that thing with all lives matter and we got together as a group and we're, you know, because when I, when I watched England in the Euros, the one thing that stuck with me, I saw black people in England shirts. I saw Indian people in England shirts. Mm-hmm. And the thing was coming together. It was beginning to, everyone had respect for each other. Everyone, everyone wanted the same thing. Uh, and that was England to win. And it was great. And we had a fantastic time, you know, watching those games with all types of people who were England fans. And I just think that we shouldn't separate. We should come together. And I think that the kneeling before a game separates. And that's my view on it. And if we keep, we're going to keep doing it, obviously, and we are. But, you know, there's no place. Forget football. There's no place in living our lives for things like that, in terms of racial prejudice to the extent where you get people, it's a disgrace. It's horrible and it's a disgrace. And we've got to come together as one. Mm. And I don't think this thing, this kneeling, it's, I don't know, I I get very frustrated with it because, um, you know, I, I just think we're all, I've played with black people, who have been my teammates, who I'd go out on a Saturday and run and do everything I can. And they would do the same for me. Um, And I've got total respect for for every black player that plays in this country. 
And I don't look at them as black players. I look at them as footballers. Yeah. And that's yeah. what we've got to do. And that's the thing that I find so frustrating is the fact that actually what we're doing is making it more apparent that we're separated. Does that make sense? No, I agree. I think that it's it's got to a point where I'm not saying kneeling is, is the wrong thing. What I am saying, though, is that there is, there is a different way of doing it. And as you say, all lives matter. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what beliefs you have. It doesn't matter... It, it doesn't matter at all what what colour you are. If you're a footballer, that's it. You are a footballer. You are a human being. It doesn't matter what skin colour you have. Jesus Christ. But people are people are taking it to the extreme and it and it, it is wrong because at the end of the day these footballers they do have feelings and yes people have abused footballers for decades i mean steve you you just pointed it out you know when you was playing for chelsea anybody you know who had a bad game or whatever would 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 get held uh, held abuse that not as to the extent of what you probably hear now, but you would hear it. You would hear whatever. And some players, they shouldn't have dealt with it just to say, oh, I'll brush it under the carpet. Someone should have back then, or even back in the 90s, something should have been done about it. I know that the FA have spent millions and pounds and they spent years to try and eradicate this. Personally, and I think this would probably be to a certain age category, the right thing to do. I would get rid of Twitter. Just get rid of the bloody thing. Don't need it. You really don't bloody need it. Honestly, it's that's part of the problem. I think because there's too many options now whereby you can connect with, you know, your heroes or famous people, whatever. Just get rid of it. You know, it's, yeah. it, at the end of the day, it is like... if you, if they're gonna if they're gonna act immature, treat them as they're immature. So if if they're playing up, get rid of their favourite toy. If that has to be Twitter, get rid of the bloody thing. This blackout that happened a few months ago uh, over the weekend, where nobody was using social media, that didn't work. It was a nice effort, but it didn't it didn't bloody work. Just just abolish Twitter. It won't happen because you'll get these idiots that will say that Twitter's great. Oh. For- things and but there's there has to come a point steve where something's got to give and this kneeling i don't think will go away anytime soon the more people not necessarily boo because and uh, i do i do want to point this out and i'm I'm not sort of saying anybody's wrong on this but anybody that thinks that people boo is racist i think is wrong because just because somebody boos doesn't actually mean that they they are racist and they don't agree with it. They just don't like the meaning because they've seen it in political society somewhere else. And it represents a political party somewhere else. And the Premier League and FA and whatever have used it to their advantage to try and battle racism, which... Battling racism should be done anyway, and it should be eradicated. But as I've said before, there should be other ways to do it, and people should get banned. They should get lifetime bans at football. And I'm not saying Premier League only. I'm saying all forms. Premier League, Ebbs Fleet, Dartford, your local park, anywhere. It's just, just get rid of these people and bring people in that have got families families are for because those are the ones necessarily they're not the ones that are going to do it the, the, these idiots are the ones that are either still living with their mums and dads who are in their 40s or 50s living in a basement with a computer and that's it or just idiots that think that they're hard and they're not they're just little children if they're bullies they're bullies. They can bully without putting their name to anything. Hmm. It's the easiest thing in the world to bully someone and not put your name to it. They are gutless in terms of what they do. <clears throat> and I was gutted that England lost the final of the Euros 
but not once did I ever think, oh, well, I did when it came to when people were saying that three black boys missed penalties. They were England players. Yeah. They were England players. And they all three of them deserved to be England players. And I, and I get so upset with, you know, I played in probably the most racial time ever. It makes today look, look like Disney World. I saw John Barnes come out of Chelsea and we kicked off at seven minutes past three because they had to clear the bananas off the pitch. I went up to John Barnes after the game and said, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry because I was embarrassed. What I can't understand is in that time, Paul Canneville went through murders playing for Chelsea. In terms through of our own supporters. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. just opposition, yeah. but our yeah. alleged own supporters. And my thing is, why wasn't things done then? Why has it taken us so long to address this problem? Why does it take a man in America to be killed for it to affect our football? when we've had it in our game for the last 30 years. It, to me, I, I just find it, no one was proactive in sorting that out. It was part and parcel and the black boys are have to deal with it. And that was wrong because it wasn't acceptable. And no one did nothing about it for all that time. And that's the problem. And what I'm saying, have an extra hour a week or an hour and a half a week in schools to teach our kids racism and to tell them what it's all about so that we can educate the future. Because not a lot's going to change now. The more people strive to, to, to make it, the more people will totally rebel against it and become even more racial. And we need to educate our children and make them realise it's a disgrace to race to to be rude about someone's skin or to be rude about where they come from. It's rude. It's horrible, and it's ignorance in its entirety. Absolutely, and I know for a fact that the Chelsea Foundation and Chelsea Football Club as a whole they do so much with all again all forms of race and trying to a lot of inclusion to try and get all. Everybody involved in f football and sport in general. I know the Chelsea Foundation do a fantastic job and Roman himself has put a lot of money into charities and the foundation to make this world a better place in regards to trying to tackle this issue. But I'm hoping that we don't, we, we hear and see less of it. And I'm hoping by the time this current season finishes, whether people are kneeling or whether people are just standing to fight racism. I just hope that people get the message and Jesus Christ, come on people. This is, this is 2021 for fuck's sake, you know? So, but I do want to end it on a good note. And I do want to talk about uh, the upcoming game against Liverpool versus Chelsea. I will be speaking to a few people in regards to their predictions because some of them actually got it right uh, on Sunday with the 2-0 win. Steve, just quickly, because I probably won't be asking you next week and then for, for reasons that you told me before we started, but your prediction, please, for Liverpool-Chelsea on Saturday evening. 1-1. Interesting, right? Okay, well, that is the I'll, reason why I'll, I'll be very happy with that. I'll, I'll be extremely happy with that. I will be uploading the score predictor league this week. I did I know I promised last week that I would do it, but I will definitely do it this week. Uh, last week, unfortunately, certain things took me by surprise, so I was unable to sort it. But I will be putting it up this week, and we will be doing more stuff during the international break as well because that's coming up. Uh, this time next week but just wanted to give just a bit of news uh, we will be doing more stuff on our Facebook page over the international break so find us on the facebook.com slash the blue day podcast for more content I've actually uploaded highlights of the full members cup 
from 1986 between Chelsea and Man City. So if you want to see that, have a look at it. It was a fascinating game where Chelsea went 5-1 up and then ended up being 5-4. So a bit of squeaky bum time if you was there. I've had quite a few uh, reviews and feedback from that. Follow us on Instagram where we are looking at archive pictures of Chelsea at Harlington training ground for those that enjoy their history. Find us on Instagram at the Blue Day Podcast. Find us on Twitter where we've got our Twitter handlers working night and day to provide you more information on what we're doing. So find us at Twitter at the Blue Day Podcast. Little bit of news as well. We are hoping to announce... Next week, after the Liverpool game of our next player interview, and for those that are not aware, the player interviews that we've done has spanned from players that played for Chelsea from the 60s, the 70s, 80s and 90s. A little bit of the noughties as well. So if you like your Chelsea history, and if there's some players that you liked back in the day, find us on iTunes and Spotify and wherever you find your favourite podcast and find the player interviews. We've got one very, very big name, an iconic name of Chelsea. He will hopefully be with us very, very soon to discuss his Chelsea career. And there's a few people that are living overseas that I'm now negotiating with not money-wise, but in terms of dates. So we're hopefully going to get them in as well. So that will be very, very good for our supporters as well. And just wanted to say, Steve, as well, before people sort of do um, question where we are going with this, for those in Switzerland, thank you very much for downloading us and for listening to us. Um, According to a source of mine who does analytical data there's a word for the week for you steve apparently (laughs) we are the fourth best podcast in switzerland so that i'm quite proud of whether or not people are gonna agree with us or actually believe us that's another thing but yes you was quite surprised of that when i sent you the information steve wasn't you (laughs) i've just sent you a table around have you not got it yet i sent it (laughs) It's stuck in the post. You, <laughs> you, you should have delivered it by a special delivery. That's great. That's a real honour to be up there and, and do that. You know, there are Chelsea fans everywhere. And I was saying to my daughter the other day that um, I used to go to Sweden every single pre-season. We used to, without fail, we used to go to Sweden. And the fan support in Scandinavia uh, for us was unbelievable. And I think I'm right in saying of all the countries that stay in the hotel at Chelsea Football Club, the highest percentage are Swedes. And it just goes to show that we now are becoming a global brand hmm. all over the world. You know, when I was coaching in Malaysia, the uh, the kids always had a Liverpool, Man United or Chelsea shirt. And we're growing. And, and we are... We're, we're becoming special in our history. And it's quite nice because I hear so many people saying that Chelsea have no history and I'm thinking where does that come from where does that where does that originate from we've got a great history and we should be very proud of it as Chelsea fans and um, yeah it's fantastic we've got a great history but we're also making history we're not Absolutely. living we're not living on past glories like some North London clubs or some <laughs> some <laughs> clubs like that but <laughs> We will hopefully be back next week for another edition of the Blue Day podcast where we will maybe review the Liverpool game and also touch on a few players that have come in and out. That is my phone keeps pinging. I'm going to turn the blasted thing off. That might be my agent saying that I've been signed. But hey, enjoy your week, Steve. I know you're going to enjoy your week coming up. So take care. Have a safe flight. Yeah, we'll Enjoy do yourself. And... We will be back next week for another edition of the Blue Day podcast. But for everybody around the world who is listening to us, thank you so much. It does mean a lot whether you live in New Zealand, Colombia, Ireland, United States, or even in Dartford. We do appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Stay safe and carefree.
This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. 